What if NAC, which is one of the most popular supplements for health and longevity, actually promotes cancer growth? That's what some studies seem to indicate. In this video, we will take a deep dive into the studies behind those claims, look at how NAC affected cancer growth and cancer spread, and talk about what it really means for your health, your supplement stack, and your long-term safety. Okay, so to give you a bit of background on this, as you know, NAC, so N-acetylcysteine, is a very powerful antioxidant and glutathione booster. It's used for liver health, immune support, and even in hospitals for certain medication overdoses. But over the last few years, some studies have suggested that it might, under certain conditions, promote the spread of cancer. These were all animal studies, and I want to go over the two most important ones now. One is called Antioxidants Can Increase Melanoma Metastasis in Mice by Legal et al. And the other is called NAC Promotes Metastatic Spread of Melanoma in Mice by Oberdahl et al. Pretty much all discussions on NAC and its link to cancer will include these two. So you have to know what exactly they measured to understand the data. A lot of people get this wrong, which then leads to wrong conclusions and bad recommendations. Let's start with the older one, so Legal et al. from 2015. This was the first big paper that sparked concern. In this study, the researchers gave NAC and vitamin E to mice that had melanoma, specifically a type of melanoma that is very common in humans. Here's how this study was set up. So the mice received NAC in their drinking water at one gram per liter, which then resulted in a daily dose of 114 to 229 milligrams per kilogram of body weight, depending on the mouse's water consumption and size. Now, according to the recommended FDA conversion of 12 to 1, this corresponds to about 665 to 1,330 milligrams per day for a 70 kilo or 155 pound person. The reason such a conversion factor is used is because smaller animals like mice have a higher metabolic rate. They process drugs faster, so they often need higher doses per kilogram of body weight to achieve the same blood concentration as humans. It would be interesting to hear from someone with experience in mice testing whether this conversion factor is always appropriate, because otherwise this would be a crazy high NAC dose of 8,000 milligrams for a 70 kilo person. So depending on how you interpret this conversion factor, the human equivalent of the dose in this study is either very similar to what most people take or a lot higher. Now onto the key findings. NAC and vitamin E did not increase the size of the original tumor, so the cancer didn't grow faster. But what did happen was more metastasis. The cancer spread to the lungs, lymph nodes, and other organs more aggressively in the mice that got the antioxidants. So to quote, Consistent with the in vivo findings, NAC administration did not affect proliferation of seven human malignant melanoma cell lines, but increased their migration and invasive properties. Administration of Trolox, which is a vitamin E derivative, produced similar results. NAC and Trolox increased the GSA to GSSG ratio, so the ratio between active and inactive glutathione in melanoma cells. Now, why did this happen? Well, the researchers found that NAC lowered oxidative stress, which normally acts as a natural barrier against cancer cell movement. By reducing it, the antioxidants allowed a protein called RHOA to become more active. RHOA plays a key role in cell shape and movement, and when it's activated, it can make cancer cells more mobile and invasive. So the concern here isn't that NAC causes cancer, it's that in someone who already has cancer, it might help it spread by removing the oxidative breaks that normally help keep aggressive tumor behavior in check. Definitely keep this in mind for the rest of the video, and now let's fast forward to the more recent study, so Oberdor et al. from 2022. This one also used mouse melanoma progression as a primary marker, including a mice that had their primary tumors surgically removed. So just like what would happen if you got diagnosed with skin cancer yourself, they would cut it out. These researchers gave NAC at three different doses, 30 milligrams per kilogram per day, which using the same recommended FDA conversion factor is around 171 milligrams per day for a 70 kilogram person, then 120 milligrams per kilogram per day. This would be the equivalent of 683 milligrams per day, and then 240 milligrams per kilogram per day. 
and this would be 1,365 milligrams per day for a 70 kilo human. This total daily intake was then split into two doses that were given twice daily for two weeks. And here's what they found. Neck didn't speed up tumor growth, just like in the first study, but at the highest dose, it dramatically increased metastasis, meaning the cancer again spread faster, and in this case to the liver, brain, lungs, and intestines. Even in mice that had their main tumors removed, metastatic spread still increased with NAC intake. And here's where things get interesting. In this study, NAC didn't behave like a typical antioxidant. It didn't mop up free radicals and reduce oxidative stress across the board. Instead, it actually increased oxidative stress, but only inside the metastatic cancer cells. Sounds counterintuitive, right? So what exactly happened? NAC gave those cancer cells extra cysteine, which the cells use to ramp up glutathione production. This is what we would expect when someone takes NAC. You would think more glutathione would protect the cells, but in this case, it gave them the tools to survive in a more aggressive way. With all of that glutathione available, the cancer cells actually reprogrammed their metabolism. They started using more glutamine as a fuel source, which is something that fast-spreading cancer cells are known to do. This switch allowed them to survive in hostile environments and keep pushing forward even when conditions weren't ideal. And here's the kicker. Despite all of this glutathione being made, the oxidative stress levels inside those metastatic cells actually went up. But instead of killing the cells, this mild oxidative stress may have acted as a pro-growth signal, pushing them to invade nearby tissue and spread further. To quote the paper, the present study demonstrates that high therapeutic doses of NAC can cause metastatic melanoma spread, even if the primary tumor has been surgically removed. Increased glutathione levels and cysteine uptake and the switch to a higher glutamine consumption in the metastatic cells are the key underlying metabolic adaptions. So instead of protecting the body, in this case, NAC gave the cancer cells just enough flexibility to become stronger and more mobile, kind of like giving them armor and fuel at the same time. So again, NAC didn't cause cancer, but it changed the biology of the tumor cells in a way that helped them spread. Like the first study, they also tested vitamin E and again, they actually used a vitamin E derivative called Trolox, and they found that it reduced metastasis, which is somewhat counter to what the first study found. So that is already a sign that there is contradicting evidence. Then again, the first study used vitamin E in vitro, so in a dish, and the second one tested it in live mice, which is more realistic and does again suggest that NAC's harmful effect wasn't because of it being an antioxidant, but because of the amino acid metabolism change that we talked about before. Great, with these studies in front of us, what do they have in common and what do they disagree on? First, the things that they have in common. Both say that NAC didn't cause cancer. Also, the effect wasn't primarily about tumor growth, but about tumor spread. Supplement like doses were enough to cause this effect, at least if the FDA conversion factor is to be trusted, which is hard for me to comment on. And in both cases, the mechanism had something to do with disrupting the natural oxidative stress balance that normally holds cancer cells in check. In a way, these studies are a real-world example of something called mitohormesis. So the idea that a little oxidative stress is actually good for you. The mitochondria need it to signal repair, immune response, and even to kill off weak or dangerous cells. If you remove all the oxidative stress with heavy antioxidant use, you can block these natural defense mechanisms, and in this case, that seemed to have helped cancer cells survive. Now onto the differences between the studies. Even though both reached similar conclusions, they did differ in a few ways. Legal's study, so the first one, focused more on the classical antioxidant action and basically found that less oxidative stress through antioxidants meant more metastasis. Oberdor's study went deeper into metabolic pathways, so the increased cysteine uptake, more glutathione, and a shift towards glutamine metabolism, which supports tumor survival. They also tested what happens after surgery, which is very relevant for real-life cancer patients. Also, like I said before, both used vitamin E derivatives, but came to somewhat different conclusions, albeit one in vitro and one in vivo. Okay, now that we've gone through the data, let me give you my take on this. First of all, like I said before, these studies are another reminder that you can't just flood your system with antioxidants and expect better health. 
Sometimes that little bit of stress is what keeps your system resilient. The idea that more antioxidants are always better for you is just overly simplistic. Like with everything in biology, it depends on dose, context, and the individual person. Second, what we have to understand when it comes to NAC is that there are no perfect solutions, only trade-offs. NAC is still an amazing tool for supporting detox, glutathione production, and liver function. It's helped a lot of people with all kinds of symptoms and toxin loads. And for many people, if not most of them, lowering oxidative stress from these stressors is more helpful than harmful. And remember, a lower toxin burden also reduces your cancer risk. So in that sense, NEC could still be cancer preventative in the bigger picture. This is also supported by the observational trials that we have on it on humans. For example, a 2025 study showed that long-term NAC use in COPD patients was associated with a 31% lower overall cancer risk. Same with another short-term trial that showed how NAC supplementation appeared to help keep breast cancer in check. So these human studies don't seem to support the animal studies that we just talked about. But we can't completely ignore this data. Yes, it's mice, and yes, humans are more complex, but these studies are well designed and show at least some repeatable effects. So even if it's not conclusive, it's still worth considering, especially if you have melanoma or if you're in recovery after surgery. That's where the stakes are a lot higher and where the pros and cons of neck use should be weighed very carefully. So what would I do? And of course, none of this is medical advice, just my own opinion. My approach has always been to take as much as necessary, but as little as possible. I still take NAC, but I've always taken it in lower doses than most people, usually around 200 to 400 milligrams per day, and only when I feel like my body needs some support. That's been enough for me, and I feel better with it than without it. You will still find plenty of anecdotal support for it online, with people raving about energy, mental clarity, and detox improvements. And I don't think those experiences should be completely dismissed. But if you already have cancer, I would definitely talk to a doctor first and think about the possible risks and benefits. These NAC studies also shine a light on something else, the importance of balance in amino acids. As you know, NAC is a cysteine donor, and both cysteine and methionine, even though they are necessary for many bodily functions, can promote inflammation and oxidative stress when they're too high. That's where glycine comes into play. Next to glutamine and cysteine, glycine is the third amino acid needed to make glutathione, and it's also anti-inflammatory. It kinda helps balance the potentially pro-inflammatory effects of cysteine. That's why a combo like glynec, so glycine and neck, might offer benefits without some of the risk. Now, this hasn't been directly studied in cancer models, but the idea is promising and could help reduce chronic inflammation without overshooting the antioxidant effect. I still take regular NAC, but I know a lot of people that are switching to Glynec, so decide for yourself. The bottom line is that NAC probably doesn't cause cancer, but in certain situations, it could help cancer spread, at least in mice. As with so many things in health, more is not always better. If you're using NAC for whatever reason, low to moderate doses are probably fine and helpful for most people. But let me know in the comments what your take on this is. Have you noticed benefits? And has this research changed your opinion? Thanks for watching and I will see you in the next one.